Often, when we speak about our faith, our Iman, we speak about it in terms of what we must believe in. Right or wrong? So, what is Iman? Iman is to believe in the six articles of faith. Believe in Allah, believe in His angels, His thoughts, the last day, etc. Right? Sometimes people define Iman in terms of how is which parts of a person of a person's being is involved in the act of faith. So we say Iman is... Uh, so we debate about whether Iman is just faith in the heart, the affirmation or the attestation of the heart, or is it also a confirmation with the tongue, or is it also, or is it also uh, the action of the limbs? Ulama debate, what is it? And there's a famous difference of opinion between Abu Hanifa and the other uh, A'imma on this point. And sometimes we speak of Iman more broadly and we say Iman is, and this is uh, you know, a really good definition of Iman, Iman is, to, Iman is to confirm or affirm everything brought by the Prophet Some people go a step further and they say Iman is to affirm everything, everything brought by the Prophet that is authentically related to us. But if you go back to the Quran and to the Sunnah, and look at how our Salaf and early Muslims looked at Iman and what they discussed when the question of Iman came up. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when he talks about believers. And look at, um, uh, look at the hadith that the compilers of hadith, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, and all of the various compilers of hadith. Look at what they, the hadith that they include under the heading of the book of Iman, the chapter of Iman. And you'll find that for them, Iman was about manifestation. Of course, the basics of Iman is there. The Prophet has taught us Iman is that you believe in the six pillars. It's there. But in terms of the manifestation, manifestation of Iman, what Iman looked like in a person in terms of their conduct, that was the focus of the discussion of Iman in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, the believers, the people of Iman, have become successful. Confirmed, they have become successful. Who are they? الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ They are people who, are, who have khushu' who, um, who, have, who have a humility uh, and fear out of consciousness of Allah when they pray. Right? They are people who turn away from idle things. They are people who give zakah, who give who, who make purification, meaning they purify their work through zakah. And they are people who protect their private parts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having declared the success of the believers goes on to describe believers of, or as people of certain manifestations, people who have actualized in themselves certain qualities, right, and certain realities, such as khushur, such as staying away from things that are idle and wasteful, <coughs> wasting the hours and hours away doing things that are meaningless um, and, are, and are valueless. Uh, they are people who, uh, who, who are chaste, who protect their chastity by avoiding zina, an indecent engagement with the, with, with the opposite gender or anyone uh, for that matter. People who give zakah. That's the focus. If you look at um, the hadith, when, in, when any scholar of, when, in, when any collection of hadith has the title Kitabul Iman, under it are the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ has associated Iman with the conduct. Right? And sometimes they are subtle internal conducts. Like, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه That none of you truly believes until he loves for himself what he loves for his brother. So, there is this beautiful value that makes a person's faith. Right? لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به None of you truly believes until 
His desires are compliant with what I have brought, meaning the teachings of Islam. Right? And then um, the hadith in which the Prophet says, faith is more than 70 branches. Al Imanu Bidun wa Sabruna Shu'ba. Faith is more than 70 branches. Uh, the highest of it is La ilaha illallah. And the lowest of it is removing something harmful from the path. Right? Wal Haya'u Shu'batun min al Iman. And Haya, uh, chastity, or, um, you know, avoid, let, let me describe Haya like this. Avoiding things out of shame, out of dignity. Right? So the Prophet says, such a quality is a branch of Iman. And the reason why I'm saying this and I'm tying this in with Iman is really to, to clearly lay down this important principle that when Muslims do things, they are informed by values, even if it doesn't appear to be so. And the greatest value is Iman. Right? The greatest value. The thing of the greatest value for us is our faith, is our Iman. But Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when even telling us what Iman is, they tied Iman in with values, with other things that are valuable, that are beautiful, that are things that adorn our character. And those things inform the rules we follow in our lives. So when somebody makes a negative comment about a woman's hijab or a woman's niqab, be, let him, he may be a Muslim. What, he's forgotten the lesson of value. He's, what's eluded him is the value behind the practice. Right? The value that led to it becoming a rule. When something becomes an obligatory rule in Islam, it's because there is a value that underpins it that is considered so important that the act that protects the value, that symbolizes the value, that sustains the value becomes obligatory. Or something becomes prohibited or obligatory because the opposite of that value is so reprehensible in the eyes of Allah and so reprehensible in the eyes of the Messenger of Allah. And therefore, and this, is, this correlation is always assumed in Islam, therefore so harmful to mankind and so harmful to society that it has to be reflected in a command that is obligatory or a prohibition that is obligatory. Right? And this is the case with pretty much everything in Islam. And the same is true of a woman covering her face or a woman wearing the hijab, whether it is the hijab or the niqab. The value behind it is the value of haya. And haya isn't just for women, it's for men as well. All right? But the boundaries reflect our roles. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays down in the form of commands and prohibitions reflect our roles. So haya, chastity, is a value in, in Islam. Because when Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, successful are the believers. One of the traits and qualities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents as the quality of a believer is the protection of the private part. And what Allah means by that, right, is chastity. Is the importance, the value of chastity. And so valuable is chastity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets boundaries that protect us from any threat to our chastity. And the, and the thing that guards our chastity is our haya, is our modesty. And these are unisex values, meaning this is true of men and this is true of, of women. The difference in how Allah created men and how Allah created women means that the rules of hijab vary for the man and for the woman. But they exist for both. When Allah says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُ فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَالَهُمْ When he starts speaking about hijab in the Qur'an, people don't think of hijab as a piece of cloth. But when, when, 
When we think in the Quran of the verse of hijab, in Surah An-Nur, for example, Allah begins with a command to the men. He says, say to the believing men that they lower their gaze and they protect their chastity, they protect their private parts. That is more purifying for, for them. And Allah is all knowing of what they do. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the same command to women. And he says, say to the believing women that they lower their gaze and they protect their chastity. Right? But because of the particular chemistry between men and women and the particular relationship of women with adornment and beautification, Allah goes a step further with them and He says, And they are not to expose the, their beauty except that which appears naturally or normally. Alright, meaning, meaning that it is too much, the, the, the extent of beauty that is too difficult, too much to conceal, that may remain exposed, right? And the ulama disagreed here about what that meant, that after covering their bodies, what does that mean? Some ulama said that what appears normally is the face and the hands. And hence you have the opinion that the face and the hands doesn't have to be covered and therefore women wear the hijab. But then uh, uh, there is another opinion. This is the opinion of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. But then there is the opinion of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu that no, what is difficult to cover is after covering everything else, if still a woman appears to be uh, beautiful because her, because her eye can be seen or her eyes can be seen or because some shape appears through her clothes, then that's what's meant. There is a difference of opinion, and we accept that difference of opinion. And that difference of opinion manifests in us. You have women who wear the hijab, who cover themselves, but wear the hijab and their face is exposed. You have women who cover themselves and wear more than the hijab, and their face is, uh, their face is covered. Sometimes the, differences of, the, the difference of opinion is irrelevant, but rather what informs a lady's practice is the value behind the practice. She simply feels that her connection with the value of modesty is so powerful that she wants to cover her face. Her connection, her expression of her chastity and, her, and how she values that is so powerful that she wants to cover her face. What eludes external commentators, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, is the value behind the practice. Right? We pray, oh Muslims have these rules. It becomes about the rule. But the prayer is about connection with God. It's about spirituality. That's the value. It's about the khushur, the humility and the, before God and the consciousness of God. And it's about, it's about the conversation with Allah. Those are the values behind salah, behind prayer. That's why we're here now. That is why we're here now. Jumu'ah is about coming together in worship. That's why it's Jumu'ah. It's from the root of Jama'ah. From the root of congregation, because we come together, there are values behind it. So you have the value of prayer and spirituality and the value of coming together to do it. Right? So there are these values. That's what eludes us. So now you have stupid commentary about the hijab because a, a, a candidate, a mayoral candidate, uh, has made a comment, right? And people all of a sudden know all about hijab. They're coming on making stupid remarks about, oh, you know, just because a woman doesn't cover her face, that doesn't mean she is unchaste, etc., etc., etc. You don't get the point. Well, just because it doesn't mean that woman is unchaste, why does it have to mean that the woman who wants to guard her chastity more in, uh, 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 in accordance with her faith has to be blamed? <laughs> uh, all values are relative in, in the universal sense all values are relative one person thinks that they are chaste and modest because even though they wear a miniskirt that's down, miniskirt, that's down to them but that does not in any way blemish the person who feels that in order to express their chastity and their modesty they have to be fully covered right? so why does one society's movement towards one extreme have to in some way 
place a dark stain on another society's conservative values because the women in that society want to cover. The automatic assumption is that because I've become comfortable showing my legs, there must be something socially wrong with the society where a woman covers her face. Who has the problem? It's a matter of perspective. To me, the woman, or the man for that matter, who wants to walk around kind of with the parts of, with parts of their body bulging out, has a problem. That's from my perspective. You want to have, you want to present the alternative perspective, present the alternative perspective. But when did it become an issue of, of hate and misrepresentation? When did it become an issue of integration? When was it about, why is it suddenly about integration? Right? I, I might not like, the, I, I don't like women walking around um, uh, scantily uh, dressed, right? I don't like it. But for me, that's not, that's not an issue of integration. What, you know, I'd love to sit and have a little conversation about it and I'd love to understand like, how society can become comfortable with little children wearing clothes that, uh, you know, that should barely be legal, right? That's where society is going. I'm not comfortable with it. I'd like to have that debate. That's the debate I'd like to have. Where is, where is society going when people are, have become so promiscuous and so liberal about sex that teenagers are becoming pregnant left, right and centre, that children are growing up without knowing their fathers? What is the impact of that? Society doesn't want to debate that. Society wants to debate the Muslim woman and her hijab. Nobody wants to talk about what our society, this society, British society, our society is going to look like a hundred years from now when we've had 200 years of sexual liberality and promiscuity. What is society going to look like? Why won't LBC debate that? Why won't the BBC debate that? Why won't researchers research that at a psychological, sociological level? And you know when research is done, when there is research about pornography damaging a person's brain, nobody wants to cover it. But when somebody whispers something about a Muslim woman's dress, everybody wants to cover it. Everybody's on the, on, on the banner. What you don't think, the fact that people are being brain damaged by pornography and it's a massive problem is newsworthy. Oh, that gets a little squeak in some corner on the BBC website. So, seriously people, some perspective, all right? Just because somebody wants to win an election because they want, to, they, they want to win over one part of the society at the expense of another, is the reason probably why intelligent people should see through the motive and think about where they want to be with regards to that person, all right? But let's be intelligent. Let's be intelligent. Let's have intelligent discussions about the things that really, really matter. And let's talk about things based on values, not just based on the end product, the expression at the end. All right? And maybe if society can talk about the hijab from the point of view of values, we can start looking at mini skirts and bikinis from the point of view of whatever values underpin those. All right? I don't have a problem with that debate if society is willing to have the debate. But to keep bringing up the issue of a Muslim woman's dress when, the, when the, the value that underpins it is chastity, is modesty, is family, is protection from, from, from sins such as adultery and fornication, when those are the values that underpin a particular practice, we do not apologize for it. And I don't care what some mayoral candidate have to say about it. Start thinking like intelligent people, not like, not like, honestly, not like uh, uh, sheep that are being herded around by whatever it is that's blasted out on the airwaves and on television screens. And that's for everyone to consider.